uh, who's, of course, Lawrence W. Reed, Larry for friends. Uh, I've met Larry how, about three years ago, I think, in Prague. Uh, totally didn't know him. Uh, but he gave a great speak up, a speech about uh, uh, heroes of liberty. And what was important from my perspective, because I'm a libertarian, an anarcho-capitalist, and a patriot at the same time, was <laughs> that he was talking about uh, Witold Pilecki, who is our world national hero. Uh, so I uh, went to talk to Larry, and uh, we changed with our uh, visit cards. And this is how it started. And now I'm really happy that we can have Larry here in Krakow, in a city that I chose to be mine. Uh, this is also one of the Larry's favorite cities. And now he will give us our opening speech. Uh, please, uh, please enjoy. Thank you, Marcy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marcin. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'm thrilled to be here. I always am uh, thrilled to be in Poland, a country that's had more impact on me and my thinking than any other country aside from my own. It was 50 years ago this very month, I'm happy to say, that I first became interested in liberty. Uh, Poland was not a factor in those early stages, but it would be a few years thereafter. But 50 years ago, next week, uh, the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact uh, that it uh, led invaded Czechoslovakia. And I was 14 years of age. But I remember that event vividly. I had been following events of Prague Spring throughout uh, 1968 and hoping that the Czechs would be given uh, the opportunity to continue advancing liberty in their country. And of course, that came to an end with the Soviet invasion. Within days, uh, there was a demonstration in downtown Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, not far from where I lived, uh, sponsored by Young Americans for Freedom against the Soviet invasion. And I went up to Pittsburgh and participated in that demonstration. We burned a Soviet flag, and I signed up for materials from the Foundation for Economic Education. And I was told at that young age that if you want to be a defender of liberty, you have to be more than just an anti-communist. You have to know your economics, your philosophy, your morality, a lot of other aspects of the freedom philosophy. And it changed my life. And then in 1986, this is when Poland began to figure prominently in my thinking. I've been to some 83 countries uh, in uh, 33 years. And that first trip to Poland in 1986 uh, left a deeper impression on me than any of those other visits to any other country. Because I spent that time when the communists were still in power with people who were active in the anti-communist underground. And I'll never forget, even though this is not my subject this morning, I have to tell you this uh, story. It's one of the most memorable from that visit. I'll never forget meeting with a group of young people who were active in underground printing. And they were eager to impress me, and that was not hard to do. They brought out copies of uh, books and pamphlets that they had illegally translated, in many cases, from English or other languages into Polish and then were illegally printing and distributing uh, great works of liberty by some of the great authors like Mises and Rothbard and Hayek and oh you name it I was so impressed and at one point I said to them where do you guys get the paper to print all this stuff because the government owns all the printing presses right it has it owns all the factories that print newspapers and books uh, where do you get the paper to print this stuff and a young man named Pavel answered and he said this with a smile, he said, we get the paper from two places. One, we smuggle it in from the West, and two, we steal it from communists. And I, <laughs> and I said, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, there are uh, factories where the, that the government owns that, produces, uh, that produce the government's newspapers and books, but increasingly the workers in there think like we do and they smuggle out uh, the government's paper to us and sometimes even when the things are really clear they have published our stuff on the government's own printing presses. <laughs> and I thought, oh man, this, I, I'm in a den of freedom lovers here in uh, Poland and I was so impressed with the uh, so many people who felt that, hey, it didn't matter to them when the future might be won for freedom in Poland. Didn't matter. You could tell them, hey, you're up against the Army, Navy, and the Air Force of the Soviet Empire. 
How can you expect to prevail? Uh, and even if they thought it might take generations, it didn't matter because to them freedom meant everything. And that has always had an enormous impact on me. Every time anybody in America or any place else is tempted to be pessimistic, uh, say things like, oh, well, we're probably not going to win this in our lifetime, I always say, wait a minute, how would you like to have lived in the dark days of martial law in Poland in the 1980s? Well, thank goodness there were good people then who did not give up, who knew what the right thing to do was, they were committed to it, and it didn't matter to them how long it might take uh, to achieve victory. So that will always be an enormous inspiration to me. Marchin has asked me to talk about the subject of, uh, of, of one of my books is called Excuse Me Professor. And that title is chosen because, as you know, I was just talking to a professor here at Jagiellonian this morning who told me that the situation in Polish universities is not all that different from what we find today in American universities. You have a lot of people who don't believe in liberty who are in important teaching positions. Um, so you know that if you're a student or not far from that age, these days you have to go to university if you believe in li liberty, armed with intellectual ammunition to do battle with uh, people from the other perspective. So that was the idea of producing this book a few years ago, to give students um, answers to some of the more common myths and misconceptions about freedom and free markets. It has 52 chapters in it. Each one deals with a different myth. And I'm just going to pick a few and share them with you in the time we have and still give you at least 15 minutes uh, for questions. Uh, one myth, uh, it may be uh, especially particular or specific to America, but uh, I think it's it comes up so often all over the world that it probably doesn't matter where you're from, it's important to know what the uh, answer to it is. And that's the idea that the Great Depression was caused by capitalism. How many have heard that before? <laughs> okay, everybody's heard that. It's used by leftists everywhere, that if you have capitalism, you will have periodic depressions, the Great Depression being the worst of them. And of course, the very fact that it happened is uh, an argument for some kind of radical government intervention to prevent uh, future depressions, something like that. Uh, well, that, that cries out for response. What is the proper answer to that, uh, that myth? Was uh, the Great Depression the product of unfettered, unregulated free markets and capitalism? Well, yeah, I, I tend to laugh at it too, because it's ridiculous, and I'll tell you why. Uh, I think the Great Depression is best understood uh, as not just one big depression that lasted 12 years, arguably even 16 years, 1929 to the end of World War II. I think you could make a good case that it was a 16-year experience before the economy uh, for most people really recovered. Um, uh, uh, there's th that general view that, well, the economy was chugging along in freedom and free markets, and then all of a sudden, of its own contradictions, it fell apart and left people by the millions destitute and uh, crying out for government intervention. But if you go back to the history of every cyclical, cycle-like depression, you'll find that before the down phase, you had a boom phase that was artificially stimulated by easy money and credit by the monetary authorities. And in the 1920s, before the Great Depression, that wasn't some free market entity. It was the United States Central Bank called the Federal Reserve. And during the 1920s, from 24 until early 29, the Federal Reserve, our central bank, engineered a substantial inflation of money and credit. We call this period the Roaring Twenties. Now, there were good things happening in the 20s. You had uh, a, a very good president uh, for much of that time, Calvin Coolidge, who was cutting taxes, reducing the national debt, uh, getting government out of our face. Cut the national debt, by the way, by a quarter. Uh, that's the last time it's ever, to my knowledge, uh, been cut uh, over the course of a presidency. Federal spending, uh, by the time he left office, was slightly below where it was when he assumed office six years before. That's not happened since either. Uh, for a lot of reasons, he was one of our better presidents. Well, um, uh, those were some good things. But the bad thing was, beneath the surface, you had the Federal Reserve flooding the banks with easy money. 
And that showed up in the form of artificially depressed interest rates. Interest rates were driven to historic lows, that fostered a boom. There were businesses, even people, home buyers, uh, borrowing the cheap money, thinking, wow, this is great. You know, interest rates were 4% uh, two years ago, now they're 2%. So let's run out and get that cheap money and, and uh, throw it at something. There was a land boom in Florida. All the signs of a classic easy money fed boom. Those things cannot uh, last, however. They are not sustainable. It's like the, uh, the drunk or, or the man who's not yet a drunk, but he goes to a party and becomes a drunk. He goes to a party, has a great time at about 2 a.m. He stumbles home and, you know, so far he feels pretty good. Uh, he's in the up phase of the cycle, right? The, the stimulative phase, he feels pretty good, but a few hours later he's going to feel terrible. Now when you come across a man who is in the hangover, the depression phase of, a, of an alcohol cycle, and you want to help him, I suppose you have two options. One, you could say, oh, well, here, you need another bottle. Uh, <laughs> drink again, you'll feel just like you did last night. And maybe he will for a time. But you can't keep doing this, right? It does damage to the liver. Uh, or you can tell the guy, hey, you know, we really need to fix the fundamentals here. We need to fix this so that it doesn't happen again. So you need to dry out. Don't go back to the bottle. That's what caused the problem in the first place. The damage isn't being done this morning when you feel it. The damage was done the night before when you weren't feeling it. In fact, you thought uh, everything was great, but the damage was being done. You were being set up for the... Uh, for the hangover phase this morning. So don't do what you did last night that caused the problem this morning. That's what any sensible adult would tell someone, right? Just don't do again what you did to cause this problem. But that rarely happens in monetary history when the government is in charge of your money because uh, you know, they stimulate an artificial boom for any number of reasons to accommodate their spending, to buy off constituencies, to pay for programs of every kind, here and abroad, whatever. And then at some point, uh, you know, the, the, the chickens come home to roost, as we say in America. That the, the easy money policy slows down. They get frightened at the, what it's doing to prices, perhaps, and begin to reverse themselves. And then, then it's only a matter of time before you have the hangover or depression phase. That's what happened in 1929. After four and a half years of easy money, the Federal Reserve moved in precisely the opposite direction. It began to contract the money supply. Now, I'm not a friend of the Fed. I would do away with it at the earliest opportunity. Uh, but if you've got one, I would say, okay, don't inflate. But once you've done that, just stop doing it. Don't deflate. That only makes it worse. And that's what the Fed did for the next three years. From 1929 to 1933, it presided over a substantial contraction of the money supply. Now think of this. First, they inflate the money supply, stimulating an artificial boom. And then later, instead of just cutting that out and stopping it, they move in dramatically the other direction. It's like running over a man with a car and then deciding that to help him out, you're going to put it in reverse and back up over it. He, he gets it both coming and going, and that's uh, extremely harmful. So if nothing else had happened, we could say the Great Depression had its origins in uh, erratic monetary policy. No, no free market policy, no free market entity or entities in charge of money would behave this way, but you can do it if you're the Federal Reserve. So it's a government-created crisis to begin with. But many uh, people, including Americans, don't realize that even after this, even as late as the spring of 1930, months after the stock market crash, we didn't yet have a depression. We only had a recession. In the spring of 1930, this is months after the October 29 crash in the stock market, the stock market had regained half of the ground it had lost. So things actually were looking a little better. Unemployment was only 8.5%. That's not a depression yet, that's a recession. Something happened that took us from recession in the middle of 1930 and quickly took us into a deep depression. And that's the second phase of the Great Depression. It's the, it was stimulated by the passage of the Smoot-Hawley Tariff. How many have heard of that before? Yeah, in June of 1930, 
because Republicans were in charge of the White House and both houses of Congress, and they were always historically the protectionist party, high tariff uh, party. They thought, oh, look at this unemployment that we have. We've got to put people back to work. So let's raise tariffs on imported goods. And uh, that'll make those goods coming from abroad so high in price that Americans will not buy them. And instead, they'll buy American-made goods, and that'll put those Americans back to work. That was the thinking. What they didn't realize is that ultimately trade is a two-way street. You can't choke off imports without choking off exports. Ultimately, uh, exports pay for imports. Maybe a little time uh, in involving those transactions, but ultimately, if foreigners can't sell in your country, they can't earn the dollars or whatever the currency may be. They can't earn the currency they need to buy in your country. So it would have been bad enough to have raised these tariffs to an all-time high. But what do you suppose other countries did in response to our high tariffs? Retaliated. Yeah, they retaliated. It should be predictable. The, the other countries say, well, you do it to us, we'll do it to you. So tr uh, trade barriers went up all over the world uh, in great measure because of that first big move that we took the Smoot-Hawley Tariff in June of 1930. So if you were a business that depended on the import or export trade, you got flattened by the imposition of Smoot-Hawley. Your costs went up. The availability of goods you may have been purchasing now is restricted or available. They're available now only at higher cost. This has uh, terrible effects throughout the economy. Anybody know, especially those of you from America, what industry in America was selling about a third of what it produced in foreign markets and all of a sudden really got hit hard by Smoot-Hawley. Cars. Uh, cars? Uh, no, although they were hit hard. Farm. Agriculture. Wow. Big industry. A third of what American farmers were producing was being sold in overseas markets. And if you've seen old newsreels, black and white, you know, from that time, you may have seen farmers dumping milk into ditches, or killing large numbers of baby chicks before they could be raised to maturity because it didn't pay to raise them to maturity. Prices had fallen through the floor because all of a sudden a third of the market that uh, farmers used to have was wiped out by smooth hauling. Prices plummeted. Meantime, you got the Federal Reserve contracting the money supply, which puts downward pressure on the economy, prices in particular uh, as well. Well, this only gets worse. And it, guess what happens in 1932? By this time, the federal budget is in terrible shape because so many people are unemployed. Unemployment now is in excess of 20% by 1930. And businesses are going broke. They're not paying taxes. So what do you suppose has happened to the federal deficit? It's going through the roof, right? Uh, Herbert Hoover, the president, the Republican, he didn't want to spend any less. He's spending more. At the same time, revenue is falling. So they got this massive deficit and in 1932, they decide, well, we better do something about this deficit. Do you suppose they decided to cut their spending? Uh-uh. They said, oh, we can't do that because, you know, spending helps the economy, which that's another myth. <laughs> Federal spending helps the economy. We're still told that today. Instead of cutting their spending to meet the shortfall, they doubled the income tax. The top rate more than doubled from 24 to 65 percent overnight. So if you weren't already flattened by Smoot Hawley, if you were still lucky enough to be making a few bucks, you really got it now with this uh, much higher uh, income tax. So now we take 20 plus percent unemployment and before the year is out, it approaches 25, 26, 27 uh, percent. To make a long story short, because uh, I want to give you some other myths uh, and, and the reply to them, that was just the beginning of years of radical intervention. Herbert Hoover was not the laissez-faire, limited government, hands-off, do-nothing president that his history books like to tell us. He was all over the place, raising taxes, raising tariffs, intervening in the economy in lots of ways, trying to keep wage rates up at a time when prices and costs were falling everywhere else. He was also bailing out businesses with uh, programs like the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. Later, when Roosevelt takes office after him, uh, his people will uh, say to, this is pretty much uh, similar to what they actually said, that what, what they were doing was just Hoover times 10. 
They just did what he was doing and just did more of it. Uh, that is more spending, more controls, more regulation. And so in the first Roosevelt term, he's elected in 1932, you get things like the AAA, the Agricultural Adjustment Act, which uh, put a new tax on agriculture, processors in particular. Uh, that's just what a devastated industry needs, right? Uh, it's already flattened in, in depression and along comes a new tax. They use the money to pay for the destruction of perfectly good fields of corn, wheat, and cotton, and so forth, and the destruction of perfectly healthy cattle, sheep, and pigs. So we had, in fact, with the Secretary of Agriculture, Henry Wallace, in one order, just one of many, but one particular order, he ordered the killing of six million baby pigs. Not because they were unhealthy in any way, but because the idea was we got to keep this stuff off the market so that the price uh, of what we do sell will go up. Okay? But, but of course, even if that could have helped the farmer, it meant they were selling less, but even if it could have helped the farmer, it could have done so only at the expense of everybody else. This is redistribution through destruction. It's nuts. But that's what they uh, thought they'd do. They also, with the passage of the National Recovery Act, decided that, they were, that there was too much competition in the economy. And can you imagine that? Every time somebody, you know, prices were falling and every time somebody got his price up a little bit and maybe had a chance to make a few bucks, somebody else would undercut it. So the Roosevelt people thought, oh, we have to prevent that competition. So they passed the National Recovery Act, uh, which attempted to cartelize or monopolize industries through price fixing uh, ordered from Washington. There was a famous example of a man who was a tailor, uh, you know, making clothes, I think in New Jersey. Jack Magid was his name. He was arrested because he pressed a suit of clothes for 35 cents instead of the mandated price, the government uh, price, of 40 cents. Now think of that. You're a poor person. You're lucky if you've got a suit and you need it pressed. And you go to Jack Magid and you say, will you press my suit for you? And, for me, and he says, yeah, I'll do it for 35 cents. He goes to jail because he didn't charge you 40 cents in the name of national recovery. The idea was we could mandate higher prices, then those businesses will get the higher prices, they'll have more money to spend, never mind the fact that consumers have precisely dollar for dollar that much less to spend. This again is redistribution through edicts and mandates. <coughs> Well, there's more to that story. Roosevelt, for the next term or two, will continue raising taxes. The American economy will stay in depression uh, because of all these interventions. I just gave you a, a little taste of them. One last thing. Do you know that he tried to raise the top income tax rate to first to 99%? 99%. He proposed that to Congress. And they declined to do it because the, there was a discussion among congressmen from states where they had state income taxes of one or two percent. And they, th <laughs> and they thought, oh, that won't work. If he gets 99, how will my state get the, its two or three percent? So he, it, when they rejected that, he comes back and by executive order, he imposed a 100 percent income tax rate on all incomes over $25,000. He wanted it all. And fortunately, that didn't last uh, but a matter of weeks before Congress intervened and, and stopped it. But, Anyway, uh, that, you get a taste that uh, whenever you hear somebody say the Great Depression was caused by capitalism, you should come right back and say, what about the erratic monetary policy that was like the drunk going to a party and drinking like a fish and then later having to suffer the consequences of that? Easy money followed by uh, um, a contraction of the money supply that was government induced. What about the jacking up of taxes and tariffs? So, how do you explain that? That's not the act of some free market. That's, these are politicians doing this to us. Uh, another myth I want to bring up is, uh, let me ask you, how many of you, I'm not so sure outside of an American audience how well known this might be. How many of you have heard of uh, the book, The Jungle by Upton Sinclair? Okay. Well, uh, for those of you who have not heard of it, I'll just tell you quickly. It was a book written in the early 1900s by a socialist agitator. That part is often left out of the history text. You know, they don't tell you he was paid by the Socialist Party to write this. And the whole purpose was to try to convince people of the value or the virtue of socialism. But uh, 
part of the book, a very small part, focused on meatpacking in Chicago. And in those few pages in which ostensibly uh, the, meat, the process of packing meat, slaughtering and uh, ultimately packing meat for sale in those plants in Chicago was described, you have some horrific things mentioned. Even uh, men supposedly falling into vats of meat and being ground up into sausage and sold you know, for uh, sausage for people to eat. It was a horrific thing. And if you read that and thought, wow, he, you know, this is, if this is really true, this is terrible, this is greedy, wicked capitalists poisoning our food, killing off customers as well as their own workers to make money. Of course you need government intervention. He was hoping that that would be the result, and in many quarters it, wa it was. But to this day in America, that book is often taught as if it is a documentary. As if, oh yeah, well, we all know that. Yeah, the meat packers were doing that and something had to be done. Of course you have to have government. This is what you get if you don't have government regulation. You have greedy capitalists who poison their customers as well as their workers. I looked into this some years ago uh, for a number of reasons. One was I wanted to find out who were the people who fell into the vats. What were their names? I, w I figured there'd be some monuments somewhere, right? You know, to, uh, <laughs> martyrs to the cause, you know. Wouldn't the progressives, you know, socialists, wouldn't they put up monuments to such people? Look, our fellow proletarian was, you know, killed in this meatpacking plant to serve the greed of the meatpackers. You'd think there'd be monuments. You won't find them because it didn't happen. Don't you suppose, and my teachers in high school never brought this up. I had to, it was some years later when I had to ask myself, wouldn't somebody have said back at that time, what happened to Bob? <laughs> or how come Bill didn't come home from work today? Is, is that Sam on the meat plate right there? <laughs> you know, they would have said something. Somebody would have sued somebody, you know, but there's no such thing because that never happened. How ridiculous it would be for uh, capitalists to treat their workers that way, expecting that to ever keep it quiet or that consumers wouldn't rebel or that there wouldn't be some reaction in the media or from politicians. Uh, it turns out that when you look at the debate in Congress over the passage of the Meat Inspection Act of 1906, which was passed in reaction to Sinclair's book, you read in the debate that uh, there in fact was meat inspection at the time, both federal and state. And I was reading, uh, there was one guy named Congressman Crumpacker, kind of an unfortunate name in this context, uh, from Indiana, I think, who, who was raising this question. He said, you're asking us to pass this uh, law to create a new bunch of federal regulation, but we've already got it, so shouldn't we be asking ourselves what were the meat inspectors doing? Were they, if this was really true, were they asleep at the switch? Were they bribed? Uh, if so, how does a new law solve that problem? Uh, but that's lost in the history text. And so most Americans to this day, if they're taught this at all, they're taught we had no regulation, uh, nobody was watching the meat packers, they had no incentive except to do bad things, and they did do bad things and government saved us. Do you know that the meat packers themselves ultimately supported the passage of the act that regulated them? Anybody want to guess as to why? Why would they support it? Yeah, well, the previous inspection was paid for by them, okay? But this bill took them off the hook and put the, the federal taxpayers on the hook to pay for meat inspection. So you could get this stamp of government approval on your meat and the taxpayers would pay for it, not you. So they said, hey, this is a good deal. And uh, so that's a big reason why they actually supported it. So almost none of that other side is ever told, uh, at least in America these days. So I hope that's helpful to you. How many of you have heard the, uh, the line that uh, this is often pitched to, uh, if you're a progressive or a socialist and you're talking to a, an audience of mostly Christians, you may not want to uh, change their faith, but you figure, well, I'll turn it to my advantage. So progressives like to say that Jesus was a socialist. How many have heard that before? Okay, yeah. Uh, this is completely uh, absurd. 
why would a man who preached things like love and peace uh, support a system that, that uh, systematically and irretrievably and inevitably and in every instance produces poverty and despair and concentrates power in the hands of corrupt people? Uh, I could never see how they were making that connection. There's a passage in uh, the book of Luke and uh, I think everybody should know this, whether you're a Christian or not. Uh, if you believe in liberty, you're going to have to confront this, this myth from time to time. So we need to know uh, how to respond when someone says Jesus was a socialist. There's a passage in the book of Luke, uh, Luke 12, 13 through 15, where a man comes up to Christ and he says to him, Master, speak to my brother that he divideth the inheritance with me. In other words, he's saying, hey, you know, you got some influence or some power. Can, I don't think I got a fair shake. Can you redistribute the wealth a little bit? Get, get me a little bit more? I think the other guy got, yeah, got too much. Okay, there's his chance to be a bit of a socialist, right? He could have said, oh, yeah, I'll look into this. Maybe you didn't get uh, your share. And if you didn't, I'll make sure you do. He said nothing like that. He immediately rebuked the man for his envy. His response was, man, who made me a judge or divider over you? Wouldn't you love to hear that from more politicians? <laughs> I mean, here's the Son of God who says, who made me a judge or divider over you? You want me to intervene and take from some guy and give to you? That's not my, my job. Why would you want me to do that? That's dirty business. I, I'm putting words in his mouth, but I think that was what was on his mind. <laughs> he said on more than one occasion that he came to fulfill the law, by which he meant the Mosaic law. And the central component of that, of course, is the Ten Commandments. I think the Eighth and the Tenth Commandments have a lot to say in defense of things like private property that are so essential to the capitalist system. The Eighth and the Tenth Commandments, the, uh, the, the Eighth says, Thou shalt not steal. It does not say, Thou shalt not steal unless the other guy has more than you do. <laughs> or, Thou shalt not steal unless you're just absolutely sure you can spend it better than the guy that earned it. <laughs> or, Thou shalt not steal unless you, you really want to help people. Or thou shalt not steal unless you can find a politician who will go steal it for you and then give it to you minus a brokerage fee. Okay? It doesn't say anything like that. It says if it's not yours, keep your cotton picking fingers off of it. It's uh, not yours. So that seems to me to make a strong defense for private property. Thou shalt not covet is the tenth commandment, and I think uh, you know you don't want to put words in God's mouth, but I. I'd like to think that maybe he kind of thought, okay, I told them it, with the eight that they shouldn't steal, but some of them, are, they're not going to get it. So maybe I ought to add another one that kind of gets at the core of why a lot of people like to steal, because they first covet. They don't like the fact that somebody else has more than they do, and they covet it. They want it. And then it's just a hop, skip, and a jump from there to, for them to ask the government to go get it for them. So I'll tell them, don't do that. Don't covet. Because covetousness, the desire, the unhealthy desire to uh, uh, take something that doesn't belong to you, to sort of worship it in the hands of others until you can get it in yours, um, is a very unhealthy sentiment and often leads to a lot of compulsory uh, welfare programs and other redistribution schemes. I remember once uh, being on a, uh, a television show in the Bahamas. And there were two socialists, and I was sitting in the middle, and they were interviewing me. They're very f polite guys. But at one point, one of them says, oh, Mr. Reed, you're, f you're for capitalism. That's what we're arguing about here. But you're also a Christian. And that's how he paused, kind of like, you know, how can you be both? <laughs> and I said, yeah, OK. Well, so you think that's incompatible? And then he said this. He said, what about the story of the Good Samaritan? Doesn't that argue for, for government programs to help people? And I thought, oh, you dummy. Well, you just handed me this. I remember saying to him, I said, look, why is the Good Samaritan good in that story? He comes upon a man who's down and out, maybe beaten, 
uh, has nothing and he's along the road there and his life is in danger. What does the Good Samaritan do? Does he say to the man, um, I think there's a government program that will probably help you. <laughs> or uh, you need to call your, uh, I didn't have phones back then, you need to pick up a scroll somewhere and, and write on it and send it to your social worker. Um, see you later, it's not my job. Huh, if he had done that, we would not know him as the Good Samaritan. We would call him the Good for Nothing Samaritan. <laughs> Instead, he decides of his own free will and from his own resources to pitch in and help the guy in need. There's nothing in that story that suggests that uh, the law should come in and at gunpoint force anybody to help him. He was a good Samaritan because he chose to do so of his own resources. He didn't pass the buck and, and say that some distant government bureaucracy should get involved. So uh, then we moved on to the next subject. I think he was happy that that was, he had nothing more to say on that. Uh, so Jesus was not a socialist. I've only given you a few of the arguments on that, uh, that issue, but um, all you have to do is look at what is it that actually feeds and clothes and houses people, improves their lives so they can live better and longer? Is it, is it the system in which you concentrate power in the hands of politicians and they busy themselves redistributing things at gunpoint for people? Or is it the system that allows people to be themselves, to grow and produce and to innovate and reap the rewards of their wise decisions as well as bear the consequences of their poor judgment? It's the latter. And we shouldn't have to keep driving that home. Uh, it should be obvious, but of course we still have to fight that battle. You look at the index of economic freedom that's compiled every year, and the countries that have the greatest degree of economic freedom, that look capitalist, have things like free prices and uh, the freedom to make decisions as to where to invest, build a plant, what have you, versus the countries where the government decides it all, there's no comparison. Uh, the countries that are the freest produce the greatest abundance. So uh, you can't redistribute it if you first don't produce it or if somebody doesn't produce it. So if you really want to help people, then you should support the system that uh, uh, rewards them when they solve problems, when they produce more. And that's not socialism. Um, let's see, how about uh, maybe one more minimum wage? How many are from countries that don't have a minimum wage imposed by government? We recently have. What's that? No, we recently increased. Oh, you did? Okay, yeah. <laughs> I understand that some of the, if not all, of the Scandinavian countries actually don't have a legal minimum wage. I don't know if anybody knows any details on that. I've been told that, that they don't have a legally mandated minimum wage. Well, um, what's the problem with this? You know the arguments for it. Ah, if government just decrees a minimum, that everyone must be paid, well then we'll by definition raise the standard of living. No one will make less. Everybody will make at least that much. Uh, but this flies in the face of everything we know about uh, the economic laws of supply and demand. It flies in the face of how people in the real world actually behave. Let me ask you this. Let's say, just pick a number. There, there's talk in the US, a lot of people say we should have a $15 minimum wage, which is about double what it currently is, $15. Let me ask you, uh, do you think that everybody, regardless of their age or their experience or their abilities or their willingness to work, regardless of all those aspects of character that play a role in the workplace, everybody's worth to every employer at least what Congress decrees? Isn't that ridiculous to even think of it that way? There's no such thing as a person or a job that's only worth $10 an hour? Well, if there is such a thing, well then what happens to them if the law says you have to be paid 15? Do employers say, oh, that's okay, he's only worth 10 to me, but uh, I'll hire, hire him anyway. <laughs> I'll, eat, I'll eat the difference, figure out somewhere about where to get it, and, uh, and pat myself on the back. No, progressives don't even behave that way. <clears throat> they never behave the way they actually preach. Uh, in fact, you know, they, they love government programs, but how many times have you heard about progressives writing out checks that they don't have to write to the government? 
I remember John Fund once at that time with the Wall Street Journal. He said, if you came into a windfall of whatever it was, say a million dollars, you won the lottery and you wanted to do good with it, would it even occur to you to write out a check to the Federal Department of Health and Human Services? Not even progressives do that. They don't donate a nickel to the government beyond what uh, the law forces them to do, just like the rest of us. But don't you think, if, since they're such big advocates of government programs, wouldn't they be writing out their contribution checks to the government? No, to the extent they give anything, and uh, uh, historically speaking, they give a lot less than the rest of us. But when they do give, who do they give to to help people? Their own kind of charity. Yeah, they give to the Salvation Army, the Red Cross, their own church, or something local that they're familiar with. They don't write checks out to the federal government. Why don't they behave with their own money the way they behave with yours? That's a question for them, not for me. So, um, minimum wage. You cannot make a person worth the cannot make a person worth a certain amount by simply making it illegal to pay him any less. He doesn't become worth what Congress decrees just because of the decree. He's still worth what he was before. So you have to then explore what happens if, it's, if he's worth less than what Congress decrees. He goes without a job. So which is better, a, a job at $8 an hour or no job at $15 an hour? If it really made sense to fix the minimum wage at 15 or, if you, or, or any wage, if, if somehow it just makes people magically better off, why settle for 15? Why not make it 20, 25, 50? Why not just pass a law that says we don't have to work at all, we just all get paid? <laughs> uh, wouldn't that be, be even easier? <clears throat> this is fantasy land thinking. This is not economics. This is magic wand stuff. Uh, and yet uh, so many people seem to think that it's a good idea, but it simply disemploys people because it intervenes in the private uh, economy of, of voluntary choices and investments where people make these decisions based upon what makes economic sense, not, be, not what might seem to help some politician get reelected. Well, those are just a few of the 52 myths in that uh, book. If you're ever interested, uh, you can get it from Amazon. I want to give you time for questions, so I'll end there and uh, be happy to take any uh, that you have. I'll do my best. Any, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What's the 10th commandment? 10th commandment? Yeah, you said That's uh, thou shalt not covet. Covet. Ah, okay. Yeah, thou shalt not covet. Don't envy. Don't, uh, you know, see what the other guy's got and, and think of ways to get it from him. In, in other words, uh, count your blessings, not his. <laughs> yes? I want to go back to what you said about the business cycle. Um, to what extent do you think that the business cycle would still persist absent a central bank? Like, if you assume that there is no central bank, mm -hmm. but fractional reserve banking still exists, yes. so banks can create credit up until the point that they are vulnerable to bank run, mm -hmm. um, I don't know the empirics on this question, but do you know like how much that is? Do you need me to repeat the question, or is it uh, all picked up okay? Okay, the question concerns, uh, in the absence of a central bank, uh, maybe it's a two-part question, uh, would there be business cycles, and uh, the second part would be how deep could they be, or uh, basically? Fractional reserve. Fractional reserve banking, to what extent might it contribute to that? Well, um, central banks, first of all, are the big engine of these things. Central banks allow for uh, many of the natural mechanisms of the marketplace to be short-circuited. In a free marketplace, if a bank uh, over-issued its uh, uh, currency, let's say, it, 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 say you had free banking, banks could issue their own notes, um, you'd think, well, they would be based to some degree on the deposits they have at the bank, but maybe they would issue too many. What forces in a genuinely free market would tend to prevent that from getting too far out of hand? Well, first of all, I believe there are natural forces. The best example of, of this is the period in American history called the free banking period, when we, uh, Andrew Jackson killed off the second bank, which was kind of the Federal Reserve of its day, 
1836, and it wasn't until the mid-1860s when we got back into the government uh, uh, extensive involvement in banking. So you had almost a 30-year period of so-called free banking. You did have an issue with some banks, especially out in the West where they thought, hey, nobody knows where we're at, we're way out here, we can uh, play a little hanky-panky and issue a few extra notes, you know, more than we should. Um, then you had some of the Eastern banks under what was called the Suffolk system, entirely private. They said, hey, you know, some of these other banks are issuing too many notes. We need to discipline them. Uh, they're, co they're competitors. It's in our interest to blow the whistle on them if they overinflate. So as the notes of the inflating banks would pile up in the non-inflating banks, the non-inflating banks said, okay, let's, let's get bagfuls of their notes, put them on horseback, and send them to those banks and say, we demand redemption now. Your note says payable to the bearer on demand, a certain amount of gold. Let's demand it. Okay, force them to be honest. You had a private arrangement that kept those banks reasonably honest because in time they realized we can't issue too much paper stuff for which we don't have the real thing because another bank, a competing bank, is going to blow the whistle on us. Um, and what did you have over that period and actually over much of the 19th century when you had, except for the Civil War period, uh, s some strong ties between the dollar, the paper dollar, and precious metal. You had gentle uh, rises and falls in prices, but no massive inflations, no f massive deflations, nor did you have the wild cycles that you got uh, in later years. Under the Federal Reserve, which was charged with, among other things, the duty to prevent uh, uh, booms and busts, we got the biggest boom and bust in our history, as well as eight or nine recessions. So I, don't, I would never argue that in a completely free banking system you wouldn't have fluctuations, but they would tend to be self-correcting and relatively minor. They can't get out of hand very far before natural corrective forces of the marketplace that are short-circuited by a central bank would tend to bring them back into line. And of course you always have to have, if there's a role for the law, it ought to be to uh, uh, provide a court system. So if somebody says, my bank promised to give me X amount of gold if I produced their notes and I tried and they didn't do it. Well, uh, the courts ought to say, okay, guilty as charged. Um, but oftentimes uh, there were instances where state governments would intervene and prevent that and, and uh, pass a law that allowed payments of gold to be suspended. It shouldn't do that. You should hold the banks to the contracts that they uh, entered into. Jim? First of all, Larry, thank you for a very nice presentation. Thank you. A comment and then another comment. Uh, one of the points that most people don't understand about monetary history, particularly American monetary history, is the extent to which state governments required banks, in many cases, to hold on the asset side of their portfolio government bonds. That's right. You were required, of course, government bonds don't always redeem at par, mm -hmm. as some people have learned. The, the more substantive comment is, going back to what you've been doing for many years, is the extraordinary economic illiteracy mm -hmm. of many of you. I served on a PhD committee in systems engineering, a student who was doing work in financial markets. There was a professor of finance who was also on the committee who had no idea what the Federal Reserve System actually did. Uh, and yeah. I, had the, I had the opportunity, which I did politely, of explaining to him what the Federal Reserve System did. That's but so common. People who are well credentialed. Mm -hmm with PhDs don't actually understand the history of financial system, the history of the monetary system. Yeah. And so in many cases when we find we're arguing about uh, the benefits and, and uh, the problems of liberty, mm -hmm. we find that our biggest problems are we're dealing with people who simply don't understand. That's right. And they're typically taught to never question uh, the uh, established order. So it never occurs to them to say, hmm, should we even have a Fed? They think that's a silly question. Uh, but in fact, that you should always be asking such questions, especially in the face of such terrible track records as uh, the, the one that the Fed has. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. So you've articulated a libertarian narrative of the, uh, the Great Depression and of history that's very uh, different from the narrative that's taught in most schools. And what I'm, I'm wondering is what role does promulgating these kind of narratives of history that support 
rational conclusions about mm -hmm. free markets as opposed to the narratives of history that are actually taught. Which is, mm -hmm. what, 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 what role does, does that play in advancing the freedom movement? Oh, I think it's fantastic. It, uh, it helps advance the freedom movement in a, a number of ways. One, it sets the record straight. It disabuses people of some fallacies and mistaken assumptions they've come to accept. But I think more powerfully, it causes people to say, why wasn't I ever taught that? You know, time and again, I've seen students actually get angry about this. They say, you know, all this makes a lot of sense, but I was never taught any of it. And they want to know why. They should be asking that. In fact, they should be going back to their schools and their teachers and demanding refunds uh, for, for educational malpractice. At the very least, schools ought to be saying, hey, there are a couple different perspectives on this. Let me give you both and you decide. But instead, uh, this perspective I gave you is rarely presented. So when you have a chance to tell students this, this, and they start asking, I never heard this, why not? Then you can say, because maybe you should be questioning the very system that uh, miseducated you. And we should understand that government is never going to be a good teacher of history, of liberty, or of character. You know, pretty important things in, uh, for liberty to survive. It just doesn't teach those things, and you shouldn't expect it to. Hi, Lee. Yeah. Yeah. They they not only are jumping to conclusions on that passage, but they're also selectively reading Matthew because Matthew is also the book in which you read about the, uh, the parable of the talents, where uh, and Jesus himself tells this story. He says there's a man who is going away from home for a time, and he he has some wealth, and he needs it to be entrusted to someone. So he gives it, to, divides it up equally to three people and says, you take charge of my, my money while I'm gone. And when I come back, I'll see what you did with it. And of course, one guy, when he comes back, one guy says, master, look what I did. I like tripled the value of it. And he's, he's not condemned, he's praised for it. And the middle guy, he like maybe doubled it. And the third guy, he's all proud of himself. He says, oh, I just buried it in the backyard. I made sure it was safe. I, didn't, I don't have anything more to give you than what you gave me. He's the one who's condemned by the master, who takes what little he had and gives it to the guy who turned it into the most. He says, you're the guy who knows how to handle money. Now, how do you look at that passage and say Jesus was promoting socialism? I don't, he's, he says, he, he's in, suggesting that it's a good thing to find ways to peacefully multiply your wealth. Yes, sir. Actually, Christoph. Uh, the passage we heard comes from the very parable of, the, of talents, I, I think. It's like a conclusion. And it's a conclusion uh, that was speaking about uh, how the kingdom of God works. Ah, okay. Do you remember also the parable of the uh, workers in the vineyard? This is so richly capitalist about uh, a man who has to uh, work fast to get his harvest in and, uh, from the vineyard. And he hires a bunch of workers in the morning and they're working busy all day, you know, to try to bring in the harvest. And as the day goes by, the man realizes, uh, oh, I'm not going to get it all in. I have to hire some more people. So even late in the day with like an hour to go, he's still trying to find workers. And to get them, he pays the guys who are only going to work an hour for him as much as he offered the guys in the morning to work all day. And then he's approached, this is Jesus telling the story, he's approached by uh, the workers who worked all day saying, hey, this is not fair, we worked eight hours and you pay us the same as the guy you hired at the last minute. Now, if Jesus was a socialist, what would he have said? Oh, you're right, flog me. Yeah, I shouldn't have done that. Yeah, we had to redistribute all this and I had to change everything. No, he says, it's my money. It's my money, he says, and I've made the offers I felt I needed to make to get the workers I need. Get off my back. I mean, that's as capitalist as it gets. The other Terry. part of that punchline, of course, 
as, and you accepted that agreement with That's the right. Terrible. Yeah. Sanctity of contract. Contract the one thing, it's the fundamental law, one of the two fundamental. Do everything you agree to do both ways. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's a, which is also a call to character yes. as well as uh, the sanctity of contract. We have a couple minutes or so. Oliver? Uh, um, in all your travels and study, is there a central banking system? We tend to speak of things from our viewpoint, the Federal Reserve. Is there a central banking system in another part of the world that either works substantially better or I think there are a number who work a whole lot worse? Um, and if so, what, what is the underlying charge for those banking systems as opposed yeah. to the dual mandate of ours? Well, if there are, uh, a much sounder banking systems, I'm not sure where they'd be. Switzerland historically has had a <coughs> stronger, sounder banking system, uh, but I think that's been a bit undermined. This is a worldwide uh, disease. Now, don't think for a moment that, oh, well, if everybody's doing it, there must be some inherent virtue to it. Uh, I don't buy that for a second. It's like saying, uh, you know, everybody, every country in the world has cancer. Yeah. And we can't find, oh, here's one country that doesn't have cancer. Oh, they, they're the oddball. Something, something's wrong with them. No, we should be grateful that there's one place that doesn't have cancer. Uh, I th would think the same even if we could find a place that truly had free banking. There's something about central banking that tends to, and international agreements that tends to push everybody else in that same direction. Uh, central banking, like socialism, looks better if everybody's doing it because then you don't have a, anybody not doing it who shows you up. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, you blame government uh, for everything that happens and a lot of uh, uh, things that government do, it's, uh, you can find everywhere in every country. Mm -hmm. So what? Where is the way out? Yeah. Well, first of all, I would quarrel a little bit with uh, your statement that I blame government for everything. I really don't. I blame... Ignorance. Well, uh, put it this way. Uh, many times people have asked me, what's the number one issue in, in America? They say, what's the number one issue in the country? And uh, they expect me to say national debt or government spending or crime or opioids or something like that. But I always say the number one issue is the same in America as it is in every other country. And it's the same number one issue as has been the case in all those countries at all times. Same thing. It's character. It's character. What's in here? Because ultimately, it's character that figures so prominently and decides what the other stuff is that we do out there. If you don't get character right, that is honesty, commitment to truth, patience, gratitude, optimism, self-reliance, responsibility, courage. If you don't get those things right, Nothing else matters. Everything will fall apart. So if people in any country are doing some bad things, uh, you can find sooner or later, you can trace it back to some bad character. People are not respecting the lives, the property, the rights, the, the private choices and associations that their fellow humans are choosing to make. Instead, they have been afflicted by what I think is the most corrosive, harmful influence or motivation in all of human history. And that's power, the lust for power. I'll leave you with this one quote from my favorite of all British prime ministers, uh, Gladstone. He said, we look forward to the day when the power of love replaces the love of power. Only then will we know true peace. Thanks, everybody.